Kaus. Let me start that again. Hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, I was kindly asked by High Ridge House, which you probably all know is a sanctuary for healing and renewal, to share some inspirational ideas today. And so here we are, and it's great to be together. Now, this is going, going to be about a 45-minute session. You're really unmuted. So you know. Yes. Now, uh, first of all, uh, Christ Jesus established for us this fact that God is the healer, didn't he? He was very clear about this and made it clear to us when he said things like, the son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the son likewise. And very familiar, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. And of course, this is the same Father that has sent each one of us. And he also said point blank, the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So the same Father that dwelleth in us, he does the works. He seemed to be clear that God was doing all the doing, right? That it is God who is the healer in every case. Now, we, of course, want to have that same humility before the Father as we each go about our daily healing work, which our master instructed us to do as his followers. No exceptions. No matter what human job or activity we are involved in at the moment, we are all healers true Christians, practitioners. And that is important to be clear about too, that we are all healers, whether nursing facility administrators, office workers, nurses, janitors, cooks in the kitchen, and even when we are patients being helped by others. Just like every follower of Jesus was considered a healer, so every member of the mother church has a practice which is made clear in the church manual and that's the church manual of the first church of christ scientist in boston massachusetts now i suspect that most if not all of you listening today are members and consequently practitioners as a practitioner myself i was thinking about this question if god is the healer how could our part be specifically defined and thought about? And I feel like I got a pretty clear answer one day, and I thought this might be a good thing to expand on and share with you a bit today. It was in pondering a metaphor that Mary Baker Eddy uses in her book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, and that gave me some clarity on this question. The metaphor is a familiar one to anyone who has been reading the Christian Science textbook. And I'm going to be um, sharing a few slides, few slides up front, front here, here today. today. Um, and then just a handful. And then after that, I won't have any more slides. So I'm going to share my screen um, to share this first slide here so that we're all kind of looking at this text together. Okay, here it comes. And I hope you can all see that. All right, let me just make a couple adjustments. All right, so this is the, uh, this is the part in Science and Health that gave me a clearer sense of the answer to this question. The manifest, oh, let me start at the first one. I have, I'm on the second one. The manifestation of God through mortals is as light passing through the window pane. Now, to stop right there for a second, as I pondered this, I thought it interesting that she said it that way. The manifestation of God through, uh, let's see here. All right the manifestation of God through mortals. I had to think about that. 
She didn't say the manifestation of God through man, which would mean the spiritual man, the image and likeness of God. She says through mortals. So right away, it got me thinking about how she's sharing a concept that is so down to earth, isn't she? She's speaking to us right where we are at, right in this so-called mortal realm. And it makes me think about how this is what we see in the life of the human Jesus, the manifestation of God through him. And we all need to be able to relate to that fleshly Jesus, don't we? Which helps us to know that we can do what he did. We learn in Christian science that Jesus was the human man and that Christ was the God power or spirit of God that worked in and through him. Now, uh, Mrs. Eddy describes the Christ Jesus this way. The Christ was the spirit which Jesus implied in his own statements. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I and my father are one. This Christ or divinity of the man Jesus was his divine nature, the godliness which animated him. Divine truth, life, and love gave Jesus authority over sin, sickness, and death. And that last sentence is another statement that says that God is the healer, isn't it? The Christ was his divinity or likeness to God, his God-likeness. And she says it was his divine nature. And I love this description of the Christ. being the godliness which animated him. I feel like this allows us to relate to the Christ in us in a clear way. We all include this Christ nature. And what is it? The godliness that animates us. We know when we feel that Christ in us, when we are animated by God, by divine love, don't we? It is the manifestation of God through us right here, right now. And amazing things take place when this is happening, like healing for one thing. And we know that it is God that is doing the healing and not us. So back to the uh, Mrs. Eddy's metaphor, the manifestation of God through mortals is as what? Light passing through the window pane. The light and the glass never mingle, but as matter, the glass is less opaque than the walls. Okay, now that's pretty clear metaphor, light going through glass. And I'm just trying to take you somewhat through my pondering of this, because I've read this a million times, probably like you, and it wasn't until I really pondered it and thought it through what it is saying that I came up with some deeper meaning. So she goes on to apply the metaphor to the metaphysical idea. The mortal mind through which truth appears most vividly is what? And to me, this is the key. That one which has lost much materiality, much error in order to become a better transparency for truth. Then, like a cloud melting into thin vapor, it no longer hides the sun. Okay, nothing to hide or block the light. So, connecting the dots, I reason that healing takes place by the manifestation of God through us as mortals, and that it is like light passing through a window pane. If a window pane is dirty, of course, the light doesn't come through as well. The window pane being mortal mind, materiality or error in thought is more like a wall, isn't it? Or at least like dirty glass where the light or manifestation of God has a harder time shining through. So in order to be the best healer then is to be the best transparency for truth. And we do that by keeping the glass clean, getting rid of all materiality or error in thought. 
that is our part. That's our job. And frankly, that's no small task. And I found that, you know, some days are better than others. This important part we play in the healing demands great discipline of thought, constant watchfulness, which is why I'm sure Jesus said, and what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. It demands daily defense against aggressive mental suggestion working vigilantly with the rule for motives and acts, both daily duties in the church manual, daily study and prayer, a praying without ceasing attitude, and to paraphrase a statement from Science and Health, translating things into thoughts, constantly exchanging objects of material sense for ideas of soul. In a word, purity purity of thought is needed. To be pure in heart allows us to be the best transparency and to see God good. That's our part. Keep the window clean. Keep materiality or error out of thought. Now, to me, this was a real find. Why? Because even though it takes a lot of work to achieve, at least I'm clear I feel like crystal clear on what it is I need to be focused, laser focused on. This way, I don't have to be trying to do God's work or get thrown off or distracted in other ways. If I want to see quicker and better healing, I know exactly what I have to do. Keep my thought pure and let God be manifested through me. This makes me think about Mrs. Eddy's comment to someone about healing, where she said to keep your violin in tune. If your violin is in tune, it is unnecessary to tune it up, she said. And I take that to mean to maintain a clarity of thought on spiritual things and keeping it there. To be this clear transparency is not something we do once in a while or part time or start cleaning the window when we are called upon in our daily activities to bring healing to a situation or person. No, we need to constantly be cleaning the window, clearing out materiality and error from thought. Otherwise, it piles up, gets thick as mud, and acts like an opaque wall to the light. Then how are we going to do our quick healing work? You know, living in a material world we, that we seem to live in is like being in a constant mud storm where with the wind and rain, our windows need constant cleaning. We are surrounded by and constantly inundated with materiality and error. It's everywhere. It's everywhere we turn. It's everything we hear. It's everything we see. Materiality is our education, isn't it? We are, after all, living in a material world, it seems. So we must rise above the waters under the firmament, which is mortal material thinking, to the waters above the firmament, which are all thoughts that come from divine mind. And that's our natural spiritual consciousness. Now, we could talk all week about how we best do this. So I would like to spend the remaining time sharing some experiences and ideas about how I have been working to do this. And this is also, of course, a lifelong task that we can all get better and better at. And certainly, to some degree, we've all already started this process, I'm sure. The first thing I think is helpful is to, to, to get on track with this, um, to get on track with our part in healing, to be a better healer, is to think of yourself as a healer. Without that, there's just not the kind of motivation that we need humanly to do this very important work, it seems to me. And this is just a very practical suggestion. Let's say, for example, you think of yourself as an athlete. And consequently, stay active and play sports you love as opportunity occurs. 
But think about the difference it would be to make the decision to compete in the Olympics versus just being an everyday athlete doing sports as it is convenient. If you were serious about the Olympics, you would have to be super disciplined, keep your eye on the goal and arrange your life and your days so that you could get the training in that you need to do, right? If we think of ourselves as qualifying to be an Olympic healer, we will do the daily prayer and study and practice healing that is required to do that. If we think of ourselves as say, a Christian scientist who is going to be a healer someday, then we won't have the same motivation to start now and get with it. Be focused on our goal. So much time wasted in every day that goes by. How did Paul put it? Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. That's in Corinthians. To me, he's saying, be motivated. Okay, so to me, that's the first step. Consent to thinking of yourself as a practitioner. Give your consent and let God work out the details for you. Then you can really start working on being a transparency. And I'd like to share some different ways I've noticed that dirt gets on the window or material thinking or error darkens to thought some degree, uh, to some degree thought, which makes it harder to heal. Now, these are observations I've made in my own thought because I watch. I'm always checking my thought to see what is going on. Now, some things that darken thought are obvious, right? Uh, but then as you begin to purify, things get much subtler. The obvious things are sin of any kind, right? Like immorality, like dishonesty or lust, hatred, revenge, gossip, self-righteousness, pride, etc. That stuff just turns thought into an opaque wall where light doesn't come through. What I thought would be helpful is to talk about how to detect and destroy the more subtle ways materialistic thinking creeps into thought and makes it harder for the healing light to shine through. One of the most valuable tools for me over the years has been working daily with the rule for motives and acts from the church manual. It helps me detect and then deal with the materiality that would darken my thought. And briefly, uh, here is how it works for me. The first line is a detection device for me. It states, neither animosity nor mere personal attachment should impel the motives or acts of the members of the mother church. Now, this reminds me to check my thought for any signs of animosity or personal sense. I've found things can happen in our day, and without noticing, animosity can build in thought. And remember, this blocks the light. And here's a simple everyday example. Now, just like many of you, my days can get very busy. And at one time, I was getting quite a few calls from Google listing businesses who wanted my business. They were solicitation calls and would interrupt me during a busy day. <laughs> now this felt extremely intrusive and it was happening day after day. I consciously worked, prayed to stay loving and patient and kind. But after a while, I was becoming impatient with these solicitations interrupting my day. Going over this rule for motives and acts every day helped me to detect this building animosity. It was very subtle, very gradual. And all this does, of course, is darken thought. So I knew I had to deal with it. How to do that? How to clean the window? Well, the next sentence of the rule tells how to do that properly. It starts out by stating, in science, divine love alone governs man. Okay, do I believe that? Is that true about me? 
Is that true about these callers? It's an amazing statement when you sit and ponder it. It reminds us of the truth that God, love, is all and filling all space, governing everything and everyone, governing me and governing these callers. So how am I to act toward them? Well, the rule goes on and states that a Christian scientist reflects the sweet amenities of love in rebuking sin in true brotherliness, charitableness, and forgiveness. I must feel love toward them as my brothers and sisters, and any rebuke must be done in the spirit of true brotherliness charitableness, and forgiveness. Now, I honestly think that it, that is one of the hardest things we have to do as Christians. It's so easy to take offense and rebuke with some bit of self-justification, anger, impatience, and so forth. Getting to this point of having an attitude of brotherliness, charitableness, and forgiveness is being a clear transparency, and it is worth the effort, I've found. It feels so good to get to that point. So in this simple everyday example, I was able to reach that place of love and peace. And as they continued to call, I was able to be very consciously and deliberately loving and patient and kind. And I asked them in a loving way to please take me off their list. Well, the calls stopped shortly thereafter. You see, this simple correction allowed me to stay a better transparency for helping people with healing, not to mention the effect it had on the solicitation callers themselves, feeling that love. Now, the final instruction of the rule for motives and acts, for motives and acts contributes even more to keeping thought dematerialized. It reads, the members of this church should daily watch and pray to be delivered from all evil, from prophesying, judging, condemning, counseling, influencing, or being influenced erroneously. All the things that can slip into thought very easily and that darken thought, right? Dirty up the window. Again, this rule has been indispensable in helping me to detect and destroy materialistic type thinking. Now, let me share another everyday type example that was quite a bit more challenging. And let's not lose track of what we're talking about here. Remember, God is the healer, but this is our part to be a transparency. So we are getting after whatever would darken thought and block our part in being a clear transparency, right? And again, it takes constant watchfulness and growth in feeling and expressing the, that purest sense of divine love. This next example speaks to how a change of attitude brought about a surprising solution that was totally unexpected. And there was a bit more to it because it involved what I felt was some real unfairness that cost me time and money. Now, interestingly enough, I started off on a real high note with this experience and was doing extremely well until I wasn't. <laughs> there seemed to be a limit to my love and patience and forgiveness on this project I was working on. So once I found the limit to my patience and so forth, I just simply had to go higher, which is of course always good. Why? Because just like Mrs. Eddy states in the textbook, Earth's preparatory school must be improved to the utmost. And that's what's really going on every day. So what happened was I moved to a new house and was now in a neighborhood with a homeowners association where you can't just do anything you want to your home, but everything needs approval, even what color of paint you paint the outside of your house. Well, I was fine with all of that, of course, and had even come so far in my spiritual growth where I'm happy to follow all the rules, go out of my way to work with the association on approval for things. I want to support the association. Well, I had what I felt was a very simple project 
that I needed approval for, which was the building of a shed. And I had the perfect place to put the shed where it wouldn't be seen and where it would blend perfectly with the house as part of the house. It was even right by an existing higher voltage electrical box that I would need for what I was going to put inside the shed. Well, long story short, over a three month period of delay on building this shed, I had submitted each month to the review committee at their request, a different set of plans. I paid the contractor to draw up for that shed, each one more detailed than the last, to try to resolve questions or concerns they had with the project. Each new drawing was rejected. And since they weren't making clear what their questions were, we were having to guess at what more information they wanted. I even met with them over Zoom after submitting the second set of plans and was unable to get precisely what information they were looking for that they didn't have in front of them. Again, it was a really simple, simple project. And I was staying very patient and supportive throughout this costly and delayed project. But when they rejected the third set of drawings outright, it seemed without even reviewing them very closely, if at all, and said I needed to hire an architect to draw up some plans. Well, my sustained patience and love waned, I have to say. On such a simple project, they were costing me much valuable time and at this point, hundreds of dollars, and now wanted me to spend more money on an architect, still without telling me what the problem was. It was like completely starting over. Three of the people on the committee happened to be architects and they wanted an architectural drawing. Well, I found out from the manager of the homeowners association who I was working through that they were making her job impossible as they were giving other neighbors a very hard time about their projects as well. And she was the one that had to communicate with everybody. It felt unjust, unfair even ridiculous, how they were treating me on this project. I can't tell you how many emails I wrote and deleted before I sent them over the next several days. My goal in the emails was to share with them in a loving way how this felt from my standpoint. But nope, I couldn't seem to come up with a message without an edge to it without some bit of animosity or personal sense in it. I knew I wasn't where I needed to be mentally. I was feeling combative, self-justified, unforgiving. So I continued praying about it. I finally stopped trying to write emails and focused on changing my attitude. I knew that's what I had to do no matter how long it took. I wanted to be a clearer transparency for people calling me for help and for praying for the world. So I needed to get in a different place in my thought. So I dropped the whole shed idea and started really working on myself, this mortal way of thinking that was trying to grip me and would darken my thought. I continued looking to the rule for motives and acts as a guide. And that caused me to start pondering and researching the word meekness. Now, some of the things I learned were that in the Old Testament, the meek are those wholly relying on God rather than their own strength to defend against injustice. Gentleness or meekness is opposite to self-assertiveness and self-interest. It stems from trust in God's goodness and control over the situation. The gentle person is not occupied with self at all. This is a work of the Holy Spirit, not of the human will. I was looking to go higher than I ever have with expressing mildness of disposition, gentleness of spirit, meekness. And here, of course, was an opportunity to take advantage of that. Mary Baker Eddy once wrote, your action must rise above human justice into the realm of mercy and forgiveness. And that's from the Mary Baker Eddy Library. Well, after several days of focus on this, I actually felt completely over the whole thing. 
the time spent, the injustice of it, the money spent. I just really gave, gave, gave it to God and let it go and kept listening for the right next step while I had this calm, totally unaffected sense of peace now. And this is where I needed to be as a practitioner, isn't it? That is the most important thing here. The dirt had been cleaned off the window. In humility, I was turning it back over to God and asking myself if there was maybe a better idea than what I had thought was the perfect idea. So I examined that over a number of days, and the only thing I could come up with was maybe to buy a pre-made shed. I was open to whatever was right. So I started researching that and thought about the fact that I didn't really know if they would even accept that. It occurred to me to call the manager as a first step to ask if that would be acceptable. And this is the healing. I was so completely changed, so completely over how I was treated, so completely forgiving and forgetting and giving this all to God, feeling meek, loving, and peaceful, that when I called the manager, the phone call was a very friendly and happy conversation with no tension or friction or anger at all, none at all. I was so happy about that feeling. Well, Without one ounce of animosity in my bones, one thing I was able to tell her is that I didn't feel I could spend any more time or money pursuing this with the committee, which is why I was looking for other alternatives, like buying a pre-made shed. And it was because of that changed attitude that the solution came forth so unexpectedly. At one point in this very friendly conversation, she stopped and said, just go ahead and build the shed. It'll be fine. Don't even run it by the committee anymore. <laughs> well, I was shocked. I wasn't even asking about that anymore. I was so completely healed and wanting to do the right thing that I hesitated and wasn't sure that was even the right answer. I didn't want her to get in trouble for me for making a snap decision like that. Plus, I was willing to just keep working uh, this through in some form because it was in God's hands and I trusted him completely to work it out. So when I asked her if this was really okay, she said, just do one thing different. Don't have it be attached directly to the house. That way, if when you move, it needs to be removed, that can easily be done. Well, that was easy enough. I was able to build it in the same exact place, just adding an additional wall to the shed instead of using the house as a wall. And I didn't have to worry about her getting into any trouble. It was a done deal. And that was truly a miracle, as that is not something they do with these projects. I know someone down the street who never did get their shed request approved. I thought about the fact that if there had still been the slightest amount of animosity or anger in my thought, there is no way that would have happened because my tone and attitude would have been perceptibly different. There would have been some tension in the conversation and it wouldn't have been as friendly and I'm sure would have been cut much shorter than it was. Obviously, the going up higher in learning and practicing my real selfhood which included more meekness and humility, was the big victory here, getting rid of materiality and error in thought. Approval for the shed was great, but all these earthly things will go away, as we all know, while my learning more about myself and God will stay with me forever and achieve much greater things for the world. Recognizing and casting out the evils that would try to claim us or use us and healing the sick is our work. As Mrs. Eddy writes in the Christian Science textbook, Science and Health, our master cast out evil, devils, evils, and healed the sick. It should be said of his followers, you and me, also, that they cast fear and all evil out of themselves and others and heal the sick. God will heal the sick through man whenever man is governed by God. 
And there's another way of saying, be a transparency for God, the healer. This was about being a better practitioner, not about building a shed. I have found for decades that for me, a rule for motives and acts has been a major help in this endeavor. And consequently, I can honestly say that because of consistently working with that rule, I am happier, freer, and feel more dominion than ever before. Any of us can daily work with this rule and find more freedom and be a better and better transparency for God the healer to work through us. So let's take a look at another everyday example of life activities and how thought can be darkened. <clears throat> Remember, the goal to be the best transparency according to the science of Christianity is to lose much materiality, much error in thought. And I'm learning that this materiality can enter thought on very subtle levels. So we have to be watchful. I discovered one time that by not living in the eternal now, trusting God with every minute of the day, but rather projecting a thought just a little bit into the future, which is a material concept, can affect thought. Years ago, when I was working at the Mother Church in Boston, I would commute into the office by train and then walk several blocks to work. And I love that commute on the train as it gave me time to pray, commune with the Father. But I noticed one time that each day as I arrived at the office, I was always feeling a little stressed. Again, I noticed this because I'm always watching my thought to be aware of what is going on. You have to do this as a practicing Christian scientist. I figured out that it was my walk during those several blocks to work that was causing this stress. I was working part-time at the time and I had a lot to accomplish during those few days in the office. So I would think about my day and plan things out on that walk through the city. Now, certainly, uh, that's not the worst use of time, but as practitioners, we are held to a higher standard, it seems. Because I was thinking about what I was going to do when I got to the office, all the people and noise and activity of the city became stressful on the way to the office. In that beeline I was making to the office, people might get in the way bicyclists might whiz past you just missing knocking you down or you might trip over a loose brick in the sidewalk or you have to wait at a stoplight for all this crazy traffic etc that's what it's like living in a busy material world if you choose to see it that way sounds stressful doesn't it the way i described it well it is depending on where your thought is Realizing that I was feeling a bit stressed when I got to the office, I searched my thought and found that I needed to make a small but dramatic shift in my thought on my commute from the train to the office. It was not a time to be thinking about all that I was going to be doing that day. It was a time to be glorifying God, being in the now of my practice of Christianity, my healing practice bearing witness to all God's activity of life being expressed in the busy city, to all the goodness and love of God going on. It was a time to be willing and ready as a healer to help heal any situation I would be witness to, not to mention being ready with a transparent thought to any practice calls on the phone I would get on that walk, which happened many times. Well, with this simple shift in thought of staying in the now and seeing the glory and activity of God, I felt the love and light of God so much more on that walk and so loved all the people that I saw, loved how everything was busy and active in a harmonious way. I saw it as a wonderful expression of God, of life. I was eager to do anything for my brothers and sisters I saw on the street, offering a smile and a warm hello where appropriate. I felt so much more full of light and not stressing on how I was going to get all the work done that I had to do each day, knowing God was all and was in charge of everything. 
I was just about letting my light shine every moment as a healer, about my father's business on that walk. I think Jesus definitely lived in the now because he completely trusted God with his life and every detail of his day. Well, we can do the same. Again, pretty subtle how material thinking works on us. So we need to watch our thought constantly and make sure we are being the best transparency we can be and let God shine through and do the healing in whatever situations we come across in our day. Now, <clears throat> I think I have time for one more quick example that is completely different. I was hoping to show somewhat the variety of ways materiality and error can enter thought in everyday life in this material world. In this instance, I got a whole new meaning of the statement that most, if not all of us know so well from the preface of Science and Health, where Eddie writes, the time for thinkers has come. Now, this was very subtle. And this is something I'm sure we've all found ourselves doing at one time or another. I had this job where I was in charge of a weekly activity with about 50 to 100 people, children and adults. And it would be very intense for about four hours where I was just totally focused that whole time. Well, I was driving home one day from this very focused activity and it was a beautiful day and I had the top down on my convertible and as I was driving down the road, <clears throat> I felt this amazing sense of bliss come over me. Honestly, like I don't think I had ever felt before. Just an amazing sense of deep joy and peace. And I wanted, of course, to just keep that feeling. But after a while, I felt it fading. So I searched my thought to see what was going on that would cause this to fade. And here's what I discovered. After the intense activity of being highly focused for four hours, I felt like I just didn't want to think anymore. And I just let my thought wander where it would. I was believing as a mortal that I was tired of thinking. <laughs> so as I was going down the road, I noticed that because I wasn't intentionally thinking, I wasn't directing my thought toward anything. And consequently, everything I saw would bring up some memory or feeling from my mortal existence. I might see trees or I might be driving through a certain neighborhood or I might see certain people on the street and my thought undirected just went down mortal memory lane. I realized that thinking materi materially like that was destroying this spiritual blissful feeling. It was actually darkening my thought to some degree. Now, I think you have to be super sensitive to detect something like this. So I started thinking. And the thinking was really praying or seeing God in everything. In a poor neighborhood, for example, I intentionally saw God and all his goodness right there. I quit seeing things as the mortal or carnal mind would see them and started seeing spiritually everything and God and his influence everywhere. I was thinking rather than letting my thought go where it would wander materially. Now, this change brought that blissful feeling back, at least for a while. So I learned something. And I thought about that statement that the time for thinkers has come. I realized it is important to always be intentionally thinking, which is spiritual thinking. And it's like praying and it's energizing, not wearying. I didn't find it hard to start thinking this way. I actually found it refreshing. Now, I know from these experiences, there are many other ways of mortal thinking that would work on us subtly that I haven't specifically discovered yet. So we all must stay watchful and pray without ceasing to clear out materiality and error from thought and be the best transparency we can be, bringing more and more healing to the world. Each one of us is highly needed for this work that Jesus laid out for us and instructed us to do as he did. Follow me, he said. So 
I hope you find these ideas somewhat helpful. And it's my understanding that this presentation will be available on the High Ridge House website later today at highridgehouse.org. And that's .org. Well, I love seeing you all, all my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and many blessings to you all. And since this is God's day, have a wonderful one. Okay, so take care. Thank you so much, Mark. And this meeting is now concluded. Thank you.